So combustion mechanisms for fuels, um, gas is single phase reactions. It's very, rac very rapid. The molecules are free. Um, they're dispersed among the air. <clears throat> the ability for gas and all air molecules to mix controls combustion. Flame emissivity, the glowingness, the, the orangeness of the, of the heat transfer is, is relatively low compared to droplets of oil or, or solid materials. And it's got a, they call a lower effective emissivity compared to oil. So it doesn't seem as bright and it doesn't seem as, as, um, as hot to your face when you're looking. Liquids are more complex. They produce droplets which have high emissivity, which means they radiate more effectively. And so it feels hotter. Very dependent on fuel preparation and quality optimization. I want to just give you the optimization combustion profile here because I think it's, it's very helpful. That you take liquid fuel, you atomize it into droplets, the droplets vaporize at the surface, and it's the vapor at the surface which carries out the combustion as oxygen diffuses into the droplet, burns, and then CO2 and steam go out, releasing more area for vaporization of the fuel and oxygen to come in and continue reaction. So the vapor combusts through to products, the CO2, the steam, hopefully not too much CO. SO2 from sulfur components and some NOx. The material that's at the centre of the oil may form a char, which is like a solid material, very small, <clears throat> and it glows and burns a bit like charcoal on a barbecue. And there may be some residual ash going through. Solid fuels act very much like liquid fuels, high emissivity, but again, you have to get the particle size down get the particle size down so that you get access to the surface area of the material. So you'll notice that we've talked about all droplets. The fineness of droplets is important to maximize the surface area. The same goes for solid fuels where you've got to grind it down fine to maximize the surface area to produce combustion access for oxygen at the surface of the material to do combustion as before. Alternative fuels is now becoming a wide variety particularly driven in Europe, where the fuel costs are higher, much higher than you're exposed to in North America. Uh, but they are starting to become widespread in North America, particularly in the lime and the cement industries. Solid fuels can include biomass, such as sawdust, wood chips, cocoa shells, lignin has been a, is a new fuel. Mixed industrial waste and engineering fuels, such as Vexor, uh, rubber crumbs, which is literally crumbs of rubber, fluffs, and tires tires are, are used in the uh, cement industry. Uh, liquid fuels such as solvents, recycled oil, glycerin, and um, also biogas is starting to come out, which is of CO and hydrogen in particular. Of course, the fuel properties um, are influenced by the tolerance of the kiln process that they're going into. So a cement kiln is very tolerant. It can take most things, tires, the metal in the tires, that's actually included as a, as a bonus. Um, it's a high temperature process, the secondary air temperatures are very high, and it's able to absorb a lot of the materials into the product, which is good. Rock line kilns, um, less tolerant due to the uh, lower process and secondary air temperatures which are coming through the cooler, um, and can lead to some buildup. Um, the ash ring is a, is a kind of issue in lime kilns, um, plus the potential for some sulfur levels in the, in the metallurgy that's going on and uh, if you're going to get involved in making lime that's going to be used in uh, for the food industry or agricultural applications. Those of you who are in the paper industry know that you have the least uh, resistance in terms of being able to use these fuels. So um, you can't use many of these other alternative fuels, uh, particularly with contaminants, because they get into the recourse and contaminate the process and lead to a lot of um, rejects. But you can use... Um, petroleum coke and it has been widely used and certainly between 2003 and 2008 it became very popular uh, in the paper industry substituting natural gas and uh, oils. Coal can't be used in the paper industry because of the inert content, the ash, which contaminates. Additional fuels and preparation can impact on operational issues such as coating and ring formation, sulfur cycles, uh, build up in the feed chute and preheater and not to mention NOx and CO are all about differences in fuel emissions. And to keep on time, I'll finish off with just one section on NOx emissions. Um, 
Okay, a lot of you will be familiar with uh, the routes for NOx formation. For those who you will not, I'll just briefly go through it. The prime mechanism for production of NOx in a combustion process is taking nitrogen, which is part of the air feed primarily, and heating it up uh, in the presence of oxygen to produce NOx. So it's typically um, a significant portion in kilns is, is produced by thermal NOx. So the higher the temperature in the combustion zone, the more NOx you produce, and that's just the way of life. With some fuels, you have nitrogen within the fuel part of the fuel itself and so when the fuel breaks up it doesn't it doesn't form nitrogen uh, molecules which are difficult to break up and hence require high temperatures but it forms atoms in the process of breaking up and they're much more easy to wreck so if there's fuel there's nitrogen in the fuel it's a much easier mechanism to generate NOx and so it can be under reducing conditions form um, N2, but under oxidizing environments, it'll produce NO, nitrogen monoxide, which ultimately will oxidize to NO2. So it's normally referred to in NOx. And then finally, there's the prompt NOx, which comes from nitrogen reacting through the Fenimore mechanism, but that's relatively minor, and not really under much consideration. Impact of NOx uh, through combustion. As I said, the flame temperature or the temperatures which are environment will impact on NOx. So the higher the temperature, the more thermal NOx will be produced. So here's a typical graph which would show NOx formation rate. And it extrapolates very, very quickly. You can see as the temperature rises, a significant increase in NOx formation. And O2 is also um, important. So if, once you're in the stoichiometric range, as in down here at zero, you're starting to suppress the NOx, but just a little bit of excess O2, which we normally operate, is actually the peak point for making NOx. Now you can bring the O2 back, as I'll show you in a minute, and you start to suppress the NOx, but there are some downsides. Now we talked about previously about adiabatic flame temperatures, if I, and as I discussed, flame temperature has a direct impact on NOx, so the higher the flame temperature, the higher the NOx. You can see that oxygen injection has a big impact on NOx because it elevates the adiabatic flame temperature. So fixing one problem in terms of production uh, by using NOx can lead to, uh, sorry, by adding oxygen can lead to NOx issues which um, cause you other problems. And so this is the NOx versus CO versus excess air. So coming back to the original definition of stoichiometric is an equivalence ratio of one. As we move to the right, we're adding a little bit of, um, uh, well, this is actually, as it happens, I've been given the reverse. This is a, a reverse equivalence ratio. Um, this is where the air is um, lean on this side. Uh, there's extra air here and there's a reduction of, it, of uh, air. So I guess I'll need to change this for the next time. But what you're seeing is, as you put more fuel in and make oxygen available, you'll have CO rise. But the CO itself, the reducing atmosphere, will suppress NOx, as you'll see here. But once you get down into um, excess air, you'll see that um, the NOx is actually slightly higher. But then it starts to fall off, and this is primarily due to the fact that temperatures are being lowered in the combustion area, as we showed in the equivalence ratio before. And this is because heat is being used to raise the nitrogen that's left over spare to flame temperatures and therefore absorbing heat. So NOx control mechanisms uh, through combustion, it's important to reduce the O2 content as much as you can, particularly in the primary flame zone. Reducing primary air uh, will help, help to reduce ox NOx formation um, as long as it doesn't impact the, the momentum too much and impact on the momentum mixing within the kiln. It re reducing the fuel plume length, that's the distance between the burner and when the flame ignites, ignites for solid fuels, that black plume, that re uh, reduces the amount of oxygen which you get into the flame at the point of ignition. So if you've got a long plume length, you're getting a lot of oxygen into the flame prior to ignition, which elevates the O2 uh, in the flame zone and then elevates the NOx. If you to cut back on the O2 on the feed end, um, you tend to, as shown before, you can suppress the NOx, but you can start immediately hitting CO spikes and other process constraints. 
You can look at blending your fuels to get fuels which are uh, have less NOx type of capabilities. Natural gas has got no nitrogen in it, won't produce any prompt, prompt NOx, and that can help you. Burn orientation and setup will also be, can be used to minimise NOx, reducing, in some cases, some uh, localised reducing zones by trying to get the flame a little bit closer to the bed. But it also can produce uh, inconsistencies in, in the way the, the kiln runs and lead to ash rings. So flame impingement and orientation is, needs to be carefully considered when looking at NOx reduction techniques with the burner setup. Water injection, spraying water into the, into the flame zone will simply suppress flame temperatures and as such lower the NOx thermal NOx. And finally, other burn non-burner parameters which impact on NOx include kiln temperatures. So in a cement kiln where the temperatures are, uh, are much higher than a lime kiln or a lime recovery kiln in the paper industry, NOx is always higher because the thing is just hotter, secondary air temperatures hotter, um, burning zones hotter. Um, so you get some advantages of rapid ignition, but you're dealing with higher NOx and that's just the way it is. Fuel type and noxion content in terms of the N2 does have an impact, we've discussed that. Longer flume length, difficult to ignite fuels, such as pet coke, can increase the flume length. So adding a bit of um, gas into it can help anchor the flame back and get pre-ignition to help minimize the NOx. Um, Tight constraints and CO emissions may preclude you from trying to suppress the NOx using um, lower O2, but if you've got a pre calciner on a cement kiln, for example, you can stage the combustion so that you can have more reducing conditions within the kiln itself, allowing CO to come out of the kiln and having a secondary combustion zone downstream to consume and remove all the CO. And that's a well-used technique in the cement industry for NOx suppression. 